we will be uh, talking about the 10,000 foot view of mobile testing uh, today. I'm going to give you guys an overview of what mobile testing is, why is it important, and what are some of the uh, more popular tools that you may hear of in the industry. Now, I'm not going to cover very a lot of them because there's over hundreds of them out there for different reasons, but we'll just uh, give you guys just a um, Hopefully you guys will be able to walk away with at least, at least a glimpse of uh, what tools do, what purposes, and why they're important, and who actually wants these things, So, and how it's important for our business, and what does it mean for our um, clients and our candidates. So let's get started. <clears throat> so here's, a, here's our um, agenda for today, definition of the mobile testing. Uh, we'll start with there from the very top there. Uh, we'll talk about the types of challenges that um, on why uh, mobile testing uh, in the industry um, needs needs uh, needs quality needs te and, and why tools can play a part of that. Uh, we will dive into uh, a few a few categories of mobile testing, you know, some of the main ones, uh, and then also talk about a couple of examples of tools that are um, that are be out, that are out there today. And then lastly, we'll just uh, we'll wrap up <coughs> by talking about what industries. Uh, care about the uh, about mobile and mobile testing, and uh, as and as a company, what is our next steps and how this information all uh, relates to our jobs. So let me ask you guys, someone out there, who, someone tell me, what is your definition of mobile application testing? Um, testing applications that run on mobile devices. Okay. What else? That's good. That's turning the word around, but that's good. Testing the, the mobile app functions just like the app would on a normal uh, device other than like a PC. Okay. Okay. Actually, I'm going to keep my muting on the uh, I need someone to mute, please, who just who just jumped in. Someone that's outdoors, can you guys mute, please, your phone? How do I mute <laughs> from here? Does anyone have admin controls? Shoot. All right. Uh, okay. Thank you. Oh, no. All right. All right, well, here's the definition um, from Wikipedia, and you guys are right. Pretty much, uh, as you can see, application, mobile application testing is a process by which application software developed for handheld mobile devices is tested for functionality, usability, and consistency. I'm sorry, we, we really need someone to mute if you're, if you're not connected to the call, or you're not talking right now. Can everybody mute? Oton, I think that's you. Okay. Uh, he's in the air. It's not him. Uh, I'm looking. At, I'm looking for it in Go to Meeting to have it selectively mute. Hang on. Okay. Uh, okay. Moving forward, mobile application testing can be automated or manual type of testing. And mobile applications can come either pre-installed. Oh, thank you. Can come either pre-installed or can be installed from mobile software distribution platform. So that's the Wikipedia. Uh, definition very wordy, but b bottom line is what you guys said. You know, testing um, software on a handheld device. So some of the key challenges to mobile testing is um, well, number one, there's a lot of devices out there, um, and they're they're continuing to grow every day. I think there's probably two billion phones out there now um, that are old and new that are considered smartphones, um, tablets. You know, Android owns a lot of those the, those models, but you know, they it's, it's continues to grow, right? So there's no way you could pick up everything and touch touch everything uh, that has a screen on it and, and verify your application runs the way you want it to do. Another challenge is that in addition to the devices, you have a lot of operating systems and versions of them that are lingering out there. Android has probably, they're up to the letter H now, you know, so it's like six or seven versions. iOS has eight of them, Windows, Blackberry, Nokia, these things, Firefox OS, which we work on in our part of our company here custom Android and Amazon does custom Android. It's just uh, the, every operating system and very variety version of it has different APIs and different call function calls that potentially could break your application. 
right? So in addition to the, the, the physical devices, you have operating systems that change. Uh, the devices itself has um, access to protocols that some phones have and some phones don't. And some of your applications may take advantage of these. For example, you might have an application that checks to see if uh, they can go up and scan a, uh, a barcode, right? And then read back what website that barcode is. That's like an NFC app. Uh, you need an NFC chip to do something like that. Um, but your application relies on that hardware and that phone to have an NFC chip ready. If it doesn't have that NFC chip ready, you can't use the app. So a lot of different types of protocols are very specific to devices and operating systems and, you know, of course, even hardware. You have a variety of cellular technologies. I mean, this is, um, forget about testing in, in, your, in your backyard or in your office, you know, or on Wi-Fi, right? You, uh, every, every country has, has different technologies that they use over the air. TDMA, GSM here in America, you have, in China, they have their own actually, like FOMA, T, TDC, SDM, they have their own, their own uh, standard there. In the, uh, the everybody, this, you, doesn't, there's compatibility issues when you're, you know, going from one, uh, one SIM card to the next. And so that could affect your application as well if you rely on the internet. And lastly, just there are so many ways these apps are built. You know, they, you don't write, you don't, just because the app is an Android app or an iOS app, it doesn't mean that they have the same version of tools being built from. They could have different um, styles of the way it's written. They could, and these could pose problems like, like memory and, and uh, memory allocation and, and performance issues. So you just, the, the origin of an app also is, you know, is uh, sometimes be a problem. And of course, we didn't even have to talk about security issues here, but security exploits is always a big problem when we don't know where the apps are originated from. So lots of challenges here. These are just some of the top ones that, um, that mobile testers deal with every day. So why do we need automation tools? Well, number one, the main goal there is really to re repeat tests and scale down costs. You know, uh, automation is really meant to uh, to fill a void. If you have a set of tests that works before or features that work before, we should ensure that they still work the next time a new app a new app is released, right? Like if, for example, if I built a camera application and it takes pictures, well, the next time the camera application has has an update, it should still take pictures, right? And these are tests that you know an, something like an automation tool is perfect for if you can uh, if you if you need to run a test over and over again. Some of the advantages of using automation tools: well, you can rerun these tests, and uh, they're really good for um, a set of uh, tests that have to be re that have to be executed every day, every hour, every week, whatever the cycle you want. Um, the most common usage for automation tests is smoke tests. You know, having a set of um, tests that must work. You know, the functionality must work, like take a picture on a camera. If you can't take a picture of a camera, your your camera application is useless. Anything else you do on it isn't isn't useful. You have to take a picture. So that'll be something you would want to ensure runs every single build. Regression tests are a larger set of smoke tests. They're tests that they're they're a functionality that works before, but it's also you know not necessarily the most critical test. But if you have suddenly like a hundred tests that you automate on your camera, and maybe just maybe five of them are the real smoke tests, but a hundred of them are something you've written in the past. Well, it'd be nice to run them again uh, the next the next time you have a new build. So regression tests are also great for automation. Um, automation is is uh, pro it does promote speed. It's very efficient as parallel. You can run automation tests. They're robots. They uh, if you set up a system where all you're doing is kicking off these tests that someone wrote. You can run them anytime, anywhere, as long as you have, you know, power running to, and and uh, your devices are actively talking to the the server, right? You can test these, and uh, I could go to bed at night, kick off an automation script, wake up in the morning, and have my test results sitting right next to me, and I'm ready to start my day. If it's, you know, if I have all red, guess what? We have a problem. But I can at least, uh, um, they're, they're great for things like being efficient and speed, and they're parallel. I can, if I can kick off a test on all those devices that I just talked about as a problem. If I had like 100 devices in the lab, they're all different. Well, you can run this test all in parallel, uh, the same exact test, take a picture on the camera, and then have results for each phone. And then we'll talk about tools that do this later. Uh, it's great for a litmus test on a development on development patches. For example, every development, development teams have a, uh, their culture is 
when I finish making a feature or a patch or fix a bug, I what I do is I land it, which is uh, they basically check in this patch into what you call a, um, a code repository. Well, what better to do? Is, what better thing to do is just quickly test to see if that patch works before you land it and that don't cause any bugs. Um, by the way, can someone turn off your uh, music? Okay. Well, <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, um, this is a great quick um, pass or fail checkbox for a developer. Um, and if they fail, well, they haven't even landed this patch into the main repository code where everyone else sees it. So it's it's a good it's a good uh, checkpoint ch for um, a developer to run an automation test and make sure everything's working before they uh, show the whole world. Uh, engineering and project expectations. This is good for reporting. Um, the example where I kick off um, the testing and I wake up in the morning and here's the results. Well, if I do that regularly and then everything is green, you know, and um, meaning it's all passed, this is great for reporting. Engineering wants to see that. They want to, they want, they feel confident and then they can walk into and, and continue with their project management schedule if, um, if, if your uh, checkbox for tests are passing. If they're failing, it's a first line of defense that you want to address as a, um, as a concern. And then lastly, scheduling jobs and routine reporting. You can just set it set it anytime you want and forget it and uh, you know pick you can write it on the weekends where you're not there in the office you know it's just it's just great to not have to physically be there and then I just expect the results to show up any questions on uh, why automation tools are good all right some of the disadvantages to automation tools well they're not all compatible with each other you know, there's a lot of tools out there. We just talked about all the apps and all the phones and all the OSs. There's also tools that aren't necessarily talking to each other all the time. Uh, right? The languages, they're get, while they're getting better and becoming more cross-compatible, they still have gaps. So if you are if you are a uh, Java shop and you uh, use a certain tool that, uh, um, you and you want and you move over and now you want to work on C sharp or something, you might not necessarily you might have to rewrite those tests all over again because there isn't um, interoperability against it. So some, they're getting better, but they're still not quite there. Um, they don't find features, bugs. You know, automation tests is, is meant for smoke tests and regressions, things that are repeatable and rerunnable. They're not going to catch the new issues that developers are working on right now. That's where you have a different approach to that. But, but you're not going to write new feature bugs or features um, in automation until that feature has shipped because otherwise, because features change. So it's not meant to find new bugs. Uh, test case maintenance is really, really costly. And it's, it, it's imminent. You, have, you will be running test cases that fail, and they will give you false negatives. And you're going to say, oh, this automation test failed last night. They're going to look at it like, oh, someone removed an API on that feature and by design, and this is why your test is failing. So you have to remove the test, or you have to update the test, and that uh, that is a main, that is a very head big headache for for uh, automation testers because they constantly they're always fixing their own stuff just to make sure it uh, sends doesn't send false positives or false negatives. And then lastly, they're not useful when you're trying to test things that are that are um, considered an edge case or a paper cut. You know, there, there's a, the, has anyone heard the term death by, death by a thousand paper cuts? Oh yeah. Okay, Tom has. So, um, Tom, you want to explain what that means? It means dying slowly. You can die with a big, nasty explosion, or somebody can cut you a thousand times and you slowly bleed to death. <laughs> right. One paper cut is not going to kill you, right? But if you keep sl slashing at you, you're just going to eventually like dead. And the and the analogy to that is, if you are working on, if you if you download an application and you're using it, and you're annoyed because it keeps flickering. And maybe uh, say Tom is downloading my app, and I, yeah, your thing always flickers, your camera app. And then Christian downloads it, and he's like, you know what? I take pictures, but it's always uh, the the button is sticky. When I press press it one time, it shoots a thousand pictures. These are little things that are annoyances, and it, a thousand annoyances will will make the audience feel like I don't want to deal with this thing. This thing is just not good quality. And so those kind of test cases aren't very good for automation because you're you're only testing the most happy path factors that either work or don't. That's where smoke tests and regressions are. And things like uh, testing those type of cases, they're probably better off doing by hand. So we'll talk about those later. 
Okay, um, here are some of the components um, that we'll, we'll d dive into a little bit more. Uh, well, first, sorry, this is the components of what comes, how applications are made on phones. There are really three types of apps out there when you're talking about a mobile app. They are a native app, which means that it is written for the native operating system. So if someone says this, is, this, this app is for Android, or this app is built for iOS, that means that they wrote the code in that, that talks to the iOS or Android um, the system, the API. There's web apps, which are basically uh, a website that you could load on your browser, but then, um, but then, but then you can also load it on your uh, browser of your, your phone. So that means you could go to Safari and you can type in bullhorn.com and look, and now it looks like it's a mobile application. Uh, or actually, you have to, it's actually just a website. You have to use Safari, for example, to load that web, assuming that uh, that's what you did. Okay, so it's a website, but you're using it, you're, you're viewing it. So it's not really an app, it's just a website. And then the last one is a hybrid web, which is, is the same thing. It's, um, it, it's, it, it masks itself at, that looks like a native app. It has an icon on your phone. But when you click on it, the way that uh, it, and it looks like a mobile app, like the screen is smaller and shorter. But what you're really looking at is a website that is um, that has some detection in their code to that checks that your screen size is now um, is now smaller than it would be on a computer. So, in it, one quick way, if you want to tell if a website is is um, is a hybrid app or not, um, you can go to just go to your browser on your computer. And go to something like um, yahoo.com, okay? And then uh, on your screen, it's, you're probably going to see everything nicely placed there. And then grab the corner of your browser and shrink it all the way until it looks like the size of a phone. And if, that's, if you see that screen, that website starts uh, adjusting as you are shrinking the size of the browser to the point where it looks like, um, you know, the Yahoo browser, the Yahoo logo is placed. All of a sudden, the search box moves a little, shrinks a little closer. You know, maybe you have some uh, ad advertisements that was originally below, now on the left-hand side, whatever it is. You, you, know, you can tell that the page is transforming as you are shrinking the page, and as you grow the page back, that's probably a hybrid web app, okay? Some of the categories of mobile automation we'll get into are, uh, we'll focus on these four. There's more than these, but these are probably the main four ones that you'll hear about. Functional automation, which is uh, GUI, which is GUI stands for graphical user interface. So if you ever see the word GUI, it's just talking about the uh, the actual interface, the front end piece. Device cloud, we'll talk about what device clouds are and how that's um, a useful um, tool. Uh, performance and load tools, those are really important against mobile. That they also exist for anything, desktop applications, web services, whatever. But uh, we we do have um, they do use it for mobile. And then, of course, analytics at the end. You know, how do we know uh, your application is performing the way we want? So let's start with categories. Um, well, before you do it, here's a here's just a, here's a map that I drew from a previous presentation, giving you a concept of um, the different types of uh, companies out there in within uh, these categories. I have a couple more categories here, like crash analytics and app analytics, but uh, but for the most part, they really they, they're they're about analyzing. And then there's a last one here that says continuous integration in the bottom. We won't talk about that today, but that does um, that does that helps with the build systems. But everything else here we will we'll, we'll discuss in detail. Okay, so let's start with GUI automation, right, or graphical user interface automation. So the purpose of GUI automation is to perform functional and regression tests against user interface. This is very much matches uh, what we talked about what mobile automation is. You know, when you think about I'm going to automate my phone. I'm really the people are most of the time saying we're going to automate testing of the functional and regression tests, right, of the user interface. Um, some of the different types of a tool uh, of capabilities these tools have that do GUI automation is recording and playback, um, data-driven techniques, and validating API parameters. So for the most part, you uh, you can you can you can write test scripts against these this, this user interface, um, and you can just rerun them when you're done. And you can test input parameters. You can test uh, 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 results of what you should expect to see. If you click this button, I should expect to see this page, et cetera. Um, that's what I mean by data-driven. You use data to drive your test cases. 
And then uh, the platforms that GUI automation lives on is typically going to be devices. There are emulators and there are simulators. Um, th there's a little bit, there are some differences between emulators and simulators, but bottom line, you should know that those two just, they, there, are, there are interfaces on the screen that are not physical devices. We'll see an example in a second. Here, is, uh, some, here are some of the different types of uh, tools that are out there. There are way more, of course, but um, just to give you a, uh, a quick uh, overview, um, you can see there's some on the left, Appium, Calabash, Robotium, UFT, you might hear some of the names. I uh, have a short description on what these are for and how some of these are free, some of these you need to pay for it. Uh, you can see in general they do touch a different operating systems. And then on the right-hand side, these are uh, types of uh, programming languages, scripting languages, and and um, you know uh, interfaces to to send reports and integration that you can use, and I won't go through all of them, but you can see that they they all have their flavor. Some of them cross over, but they all do something different. So let's just do a quick uh, watch a quick demo on Appium. You know we won't see the whole thing, but I'll just give you guys a, a picture and I'll try to talk through it. So what you see here is uh, the Appium. Um, automation tool. Um, on the left hand side is what you call a uh, simulator. It is, um, it is what, uh, I'm sorry, emulator, not simulator. Emulator is basically a I image of the, the real, a real phone. So this is probably a Nexus 4 or something like that. Um, th this, test, this test right now is opening up um, an, a, a, web, a, a native application. It looks like it's a Flickr application and it's basically doing these operations. And you can see on the right, upper right-hand side, those are that's that's the code, that's the Python code that goes line by line executing what they have, uh, what a what a tester would write these test scripts, and basically do this, next do this, next do this, and a lot of this is just click on this, and then wait six seconds. Not right now, I'm asleep. Wait six seconds, and you know, for the page to load, you see how they have drop downs. Now, the next thing you do is look for the element, um, and then tap on that. You see mobile dash tap, so he's tapping an area on the screen. You can see the XY coordinates in the in the in there X dot fifteen that those are XY coordinates of where you're going to tap. Um, but bottom line is uh, it's 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 executing the script as it goes. Uh, on the bottom right hand corner, that's the output, right? That's a debugging output that usually um, is there to see if uh, every, anything goes wrong. You can always record and play this back later. Um, but what you're seeing right now is a real live uh, the live demo of of uh, an application that they ran Appium using Python. Okay, next section was device cloud. So um, the device cloud is, uh, is is ability to access uh, physical devices in a virtual environment. So uh, remember we talked about one of the key challenges being there's just way too many phones in the world and tablets in the world to test on. And if anyone is ever going to test on these phones, they would have to either buy them all or they would just have to, you know, have some crazy insane way to have someone test these phones around the world, you know, for you. Well, that's not possible, right? That's the physical part of it. So device clouds try to bring a, a, a closer solution by, um, like, there are companies out there that would actually, they would actually buy all the phones or tablets, and they would update all the inventory all the time, and they would put it into a uh, a, a, a server environment and rack them up like computers, and each one of the devices will be hooked to um, a, a computer that will basically identify what phones are what, and these are real phones, but they're accessible through a um, through a web interface. <clears throat> the the usage of um, device clouds, well, you have a large range of devices. You know, you can uh, you you don't have to buy them, right? You just, uh, I can I can pay for a service that they will go out and buy all these phones, and I can access their phones at any time of the phones I want. A lot of times, testers are only going to be using phones, um, these special phones, for one or two re test cases. And they're typically going to run their test cases on the same phone, especially if you're running automation. You don't really care too much about the phone testing. When you're doing manual testing, it's a little you, you got to be a little bit more specialized. So that's the second usage there. Um, some people might not have that particular phone on that particular version of Android, so they'll use device cloud services to have more variety, and they can actually manually test our app by uploading it to the to the device cloud and running their test there. Uh, Device clouds allow you to record scripts and import your tests, like what we just saw the Appium test. Their device clouds, they're compatible with Appium. They can integrate that test directly into their cloud and run it across all their phones. So it's really nice. They have they have rich API integration using REST that they can uh, that anybody can any uh, tool company can just write um, compatibility with their clouds. 
service. And lastly, it, um, it does reporting for you. It will tell you a screenshot. It'll tell you where the errors failed. It'll give you a time stamp. Everything is just very, they're very, very, uh, um, very detailed in, in uh, information you get. Uh, platform, physical devices, uh, or you can use a website if you want. So some of these device cloud tools, um, uh, you'll see some of these on the left. Uh, I won't, I'm running on time, so I won't read them all. But uh, as you can see, uh, uh, some of the the descriptions of them, they run they run uh, the different OSs like Android iOS. Some of them use different types of tools um, like Calabash for Xamarin, whereas Perfecta Mobile does except Java. Um, a lot of these are pay per usage. So uh, if you were to use a device cloud service, you'd probably pay a certain fee for to use for a month, and then you can have access to like 1,500 to 2,000 devices. You know, now these are all shared, by the way. They're you know, to, so you have to uh, access these phones when uh, either by inner queue or they have to wait, you know, in line. So uh, here is um, here is a demo of Xamarin and uh, of Test Cloud in San Francisco, and I'll just show you a quick demo here. <coughs> so this is uh, this is someone's uh, logging into uh, Xamarin's website called TestCloudXamarin.com. They have an account there, and as you can see in this account. He's, at, he's now at a screen where he can choose which device he wants to use. Okay, so he wants to choose all those. And they, they tell you the name of the phone. And then uh, now he's executing his test, actually. And you can see, you can't really see it there, but you see how the screen sort of changes? What's ha and then you see how the on the left-hand side is going down down the rows? Well, that's what's actually happening. He's, he wrote an automated test script that allows, that basically starts the app on these phones, scrolls through it. You know, it's very self-explanatory on the left-hand side what you're doing there, but Eventually, it's automatically um, doing what we saw in Appium, is just scrolling, and it's uh, but it's now doing it on these phones, these real phones. These are real phones now, it's sitting in a uh, device lab uh, with a uh, interface that that uh, that these companies built, um, and you can and here's the test results, right? You can see all sorted by timestamp. You can see what failed. They have nice reports to tell you how many failed, how many passes, breaking down by which OS is, which phone. What are the memory usages? If there's any screenshots uh, of errors, they will show those to you too. But you can see, um, you know, here he goes. The real time. You see how like the some of you see that one one app in the middle or oh, earlier. See that's a that's a sign of error, right? How come that screen didn't show up on that step like the rest of them? So he clicked on it. It turned red. Now he's just he's debugging what the error is. He can see the exception, and now he can take that information and he can copy it to a bug and submit it to a developer. So having a usage of device test labs is very powerful if you don't have access to all these phones and also you just want to run a lot of regression tests and have and, and it's also cheaper too, you know, instead of buying those phones and running all these tests and setting up your own server, they already do all that for you. Okay? Any questions? All right, let's move on. Okay, third category is performance and load. So Purpose of that is to simulate load load environments and performance environments against the web and mobile apps. Do you want to go? Load testing and performance testing is basically um, is basically trying to simulate um, users and also try to simulate um, uh, at what point does your application start decaying and not being able to be used in a in an efficient manner. Okay, so there are tools that do this for you. Um, and, the, um, and some of these performance load tools, again, these are not necessarily tied to mobile only. Um, they work across, a lot of these are built for multiple applications, desktop applications, web applications, um, but uh, mobile now is being supported. So again, you can simulate users, you can create, uh, if I wanted to, uh, say if I'm testing Facebook and I want to test a million users before I go live, I can uh, set up uh, Roblox and, and create uh, these, these uh, fake set of numbers. And then run certain sets of te automated tests and see what happens to the, the system uh, under a uh, heavy load. Uh, I can also create performance roadblocks, meaning that if I can uh, run a couple of tests that do a certain set of things, um, does it start deteriorating over time? Let's say I'm playing a video game, a video game app on a phone, and I just uh, I, I run the same. Uh, I have a guy that's running a circle back and forth um, on the screen. I do it for 72 hours, right? Just constantly, just running back and forth on, in the game. Does a performance slow down? Does a memory start leaking? Is there? Does it crash? You know, those kind of things. That's where performance testing is really important. And then obviously uh, the, the other piece is to interface this with um, 
uh, with a build system and have these automatically be pushed when uh, as soon as code is checked in you can run certain tests and not worry about um, having to do these things every time. Uh, platform is typically against a server, farm, or virtual machine. But you can hook up real devices against these environments. So here's some of the tools that are out there that are popular ones, HP Load Runner, Cloud Test, Apache, NeoLoad. Again, they're all they, they do performance, they do loads, some of the open source, some are not, and they all support the, the type of languages on the right hand side. <clears throat> and environments. So here's a quick test uh, demo on a cloud test. So you can uh, see what they do. I won't go through the whole thing, but it, it, so here's an interface. This is a application that that it hooks up to. Uh, in this case, I think they're I'm not sure they're using it against just a standard application here. But um, they're setting up their environment. They're looking for oh, they're testing a website here. So they're looking at this uh, website. You know, again, you could this could be a mobile application either way. But the goal here is you can visualize what you're doing. You can uh, run the test to in this case. Looks like their their test is to is to check out a bunch of items into a cart on that Sosa page. So at this point, you have all your inputs. What they did was they put all their inputs into the into this test application, and now there's now they're going to uh, set some uh, checkpoints in their in their test to to see if it would load after a certain time, um, you know the performance. You kind of see the little um, help help text messages pop up and go away. Okay, here he's setting up a, a server location, a server farm, so you can run it against you know a physical server or virtual. I'm not really. Sure. I think in this case it's physical. So he's setting up a um, a load now. So he's he's actually. Um, in, instantiating a, a larger set of uh, a simulated um, simulated users, and now they're pointing to that test server that was in that East Coast and Santa Clara farm, and they're running their test, and uh, and it looks like they're um, now execution is set up. So now this is what now it's all ready to go. The test cases are there. The location, uh, the the file structure is below. The location of the is is, um, is set up. And they're running their test. So I don't know how this ends. Um, he just sets some 30-minute uh, increments um, so you can check and do checkpoints and see what the statuses are. But the powerful thing, about, and there's some nice graphs and all that. But the powerful thing about load testing for those that are um, that hire that work in load testing and stress testing and and uh, performance testing, this is what they look at all day. They're they're not looking at functionality like uh, UI automation. They're looking at how this application behaves under a certain environment, you know, at a certain, um, you know, certain time of day. You know, is the network traffic huge, um, or is it? What happens when it's downtime? Uh, what, how fast is it, this application behave? Uh, what's the response time? You know, you can see all those information is shown up here, and uh, you can use all this for mobile. Okay. All right, so a few more minutes. Um, so we're almost done. App analytics is the last area of the section I wanted to cover. So um, this is basically the purpose of app analytics is monitoring the app usage and statistics. As simple as that. Um, as we all know, applications are really, really important to businesses these days. Even like you know, if you're a single developer that just built the app at home, or you're a large company that relies all your businesses on apps, um, you got to know what people are doing with it, right? Not just crashes and loads and hangs, but you got to know is it is it being used right. So there are a lot of companies that do this work for you, and they um, and they get this information, and you can take that information and then figure out how to, to mend this into your business plan. Um, some of the usages that app analytics pr uh, companies do is they track trends in installs. You know they want to see so they, one one stat is how many installs did uh, how many people download my app this month, right? How many people deleted the app off the phone? <laughs> How long was the app up before it, it crashed? You know, these are some of the dif different numbers that you can scrape and and, uh, and and pull out from either the server side or, or watching the, your trends and how you use the app. Uh, these the data is used for KPIs and objectives. Businesses will change their business model based off of the trends in um, and data from these app and analytics. It's it's really it's really powerful. 
And then lastly, uh, there, these apps have nice tools. You can watch it. You can look at the data real time. It's uh, it's there's there's it's all big data from your user experience and and others on the phone. So, uh, platform is going to be typically the um, you know Android and iOS. Uh, they have their own tools, by the way. iOS and Android, the the, the operating system itself have analytics that they interact with. They have interface APIs with these third party tools. Um, and then like for example, I need to return the fact that this your, my app installed on a Samsung Galaxy S6, right? So Android will have a, have a REST API where you can pull that data out. And then of course, the, in, the app itself has uh, hooks in there where you can write um, certain functions in there that it will spit out information. So let's say you're, um, you're playing a game and at every level, we would have a, a function in there saying checkpoint, uh, send my information to the server so that you know, I'm at this level you know, like say Candy Crush, right? Candy Crush will remember it's the game's all off of the server side, so that when you restart restart your app and you log in, hey, you're already starting where you're at. But in-app analytics will also tell you, you know, um, we last saved your position here. Now we know that out of all the people using Candy Crush, there's only so many people on this level, et cetera, et cetera. You can use that data for anything you want. All big data. Some of the different tools out there, again, I'm just limited here, but you can see uh, App Annie, Flurry, which is bought by Yahoo, New Relic, AppSeed. These are all, they all have a different uh, tricks in there. App Annie is a very popular one. Uh, about 90% of the apps <coughs> on Google and Amazon are, do you have App Annie in their services. Uh, they track usages and installs. Uh, Flurry is great at um, setting your user path, letting, uh, letting you check, pick and choose your length. Um, New Relic is real time and AppSeed. AppSeed is cool. I'll show you a demo on that. But essentially, you can see how um, uh, really the common uh, platforms are going to be iOS and Android, even though uh, Flurry goes ahead and pokes into Windows now and DB. So here's a quick demo. Just talk. This is a short one. So this one, AppSeed, is it's 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 called AppSeed because it's it sees what your app's doing. <laughs> it's literally like eyeballs um, that is fall, uh, sits, sits behind you and watches what you do. Right, which is kind of creepy, but it's watching it from the app perspective. Well, let's go back and do that a little fast. So, real quick, um, you can see this person is uh, he's going up and down and, and uh, streaming through the page. You can see where they're clicking. You can see on the left hand side what their operations are. Um, you know, because this is all open for the app to record this information. Right, it's just like a recording. It's recording those steps. Right, you're not actually testing. You're recording those steps, and then they can take that information and send them back to the server. And then now you can see, oh, how many people actually uh, knew how to get through the page without any help? Or how many people are stuck on a and, – and UX designers love this app because they will use it as a way to poll if their um, applications are, are intuitive or not, you know, on the, on the home screen. Okay. All right, that's a lot of information. Well, done. Who's affected in next steps? So industries that show interest in mobile tools are retail, financial, healthcare, software, everyone. Right there's there anyone nowadays that that wants to uh, touch an app that wants uh, whether they use their app for their business purposes or for other reasons they're gonna probably want to have an interest in mobile testing tools because they want quality right anyone that says I want to work on I want good quality on my app and it's gonna be used by somebody whether enterprise or a consumer they're gonna want they're gonna have an interest in this group so that's everybody that would so what's next step for you guys for everyone on this call well. Um, first thing I suggest is get a little more familiar with these these uh, different tools I talked about. We, we 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 today we just talked about the four groupings, right? And there's other groupings out there, but those are four main ones. But now I'll start looking at the, like uh, what tools are actually in these groupings, and you'll start seeing these names on resumes and on um, on job descriptions. Like oh, you must have Appium experience. Oh, okay, that means that you want someone that knows Android and has written automation against a device, an Android device. Oh, you must know Selenium. Testing. Oh, you probably need someone that knows how to use um, the web and test against websites and automate testing against that. So, or you know, uh, so there's a lot of these uh, different names out there, and there's a lot of them. Let's go back and look through this, and like, oh, these uh, these look familiar now. I mean, next time you see them, let's go and see what category that particular tool falls under. Uh, find out what company's mobile strategy is. We've said this many times, you know, to the BDMs, but you got to figure out what that is. Did they have a mobile strategy, or they have a mobile application? Or they want to build one, they got to have a strategy. You know, are they gonna are they gonna use it to sell um, to to have a shopping cart so you can buy more stuff through the app? Are you gonna use it so are you gonna build an app so you can communicate with um, with another company across the country? 
you know, like a text messaging. You know, what is their strategy? And what's the use for it? And then that, then from there, you can decide, oh, what apps, what test tools are actually good for what you're trying to do. Um, ask if they have a testing strategy in place, and if it does, include automation. Because okay, now they have a testing strategy. Well, you don't know if they have a testing strategy, so you ask them, do you do testing? If they say yes, we do, or we don't. Then now, I'll start thinking about, well, okay, how have you automated this? Because we all know the complexity of the problems we talked about on the first second slide. So now we need to figure out like what can how can we solve their how can we help solve their problems? And a lot of it automation can take care of a lot of the issues. Uh, it won't solve it all, but it will help. And then lastly, expand past your smartphones and realize that mobile application tools do include things like IoT. Nowadays, wearables, automotive, medical, anything that has a word smart to it. You don't have to limit yourself to just a device, a phone, or a tablet. Any, uh, these things are, as long as it's got an internet connect connect connection and it has an interface on it, you probably can use a tool to do something and automate the type of quality testing we were talking about. So, and finally, um, the conclusion here is tools are tools. They are not going to do anything for you um, if you don't know how to use them. If you don't use them the right way, they're, not, they're just going to do what you set it up to be. So they are as good as you use them. So tools are a supplement to the quality. They are not the they are not the solution. So remember that when people try to push tools on you, they're like oh, what tools do you use? What tools do you use? It's 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 a supplementary level to quality. You still have to do things, um, you know, it, with uh with your your head and your brain. <clears throat> but they are becoming more ubiquitous to releases these days. Applications on mobile are shipping faster than they ever have. Windows, you know, your software Windows took like two, three years in the past, right? Windows 10 just took like three years, two years just now. I mean, those old applications, Office, those things, um, they're, that's not how it is anymore. Nowadays, applications shipped almost every week to two weeks, to so sometimes a month, it depends. So uh, it's even more important to integrate um, tools into the whole entire release and the end process, which includes the automation. Um, some of the categories of mobile tools you'll see there, uh, that's the conclusion. I mean, just remember the GUI automation, the device cloud performance analytics, and, then, and what tools fall under that category. And then lastly, the best approach to effective mobile quality is a combination of manual and automation. Okay, so manual testing is always going to be there. We always have, we will always catch things that people can't see. Um, with our human eyes. We will catch those edge cases. We will find new bugs and features. Uh, manual testers still have to have that, um, you know, that, that edge to them. And, that, and manual testing no longer means you have a title of a manual tester. Even anybody who uses the app is a manual tester. You know, if you, if you have an app and you are playing, you're checking the Southwest, yeah, you're using it, but you're actually testing it too, right? So realize um, that you can't replace everything with automation, but using it together in a combination is the most effective way. Okay, we're on the hour. Sorry, I don't leave any time for questions, but does anyone have any questions? <laughs> oh, oh, I had a quick one. Uh, he's in flight, so he can't ask it himself. Is there, is there, if, you know, because we're often asked as, as a DSA or anyone that's doing this, do you do or do you offer automated testing? Is there a preferred response that, that would, would be to that one if these guys are asked out in the field? Do you guys do automated testing? What should, what should be the response to that? The answer is, we work. We 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 cover testing in our practice, and so yes, we do automated testing. Yeah. Now, when we say we do automated testing, they ask you, oh, what kind of automated testing do you do? You know what? This is what our practices are, right? We we find folks to to uh, to um, to integrate within the tools of what the clients are looking for. So at that time, you can say, oh yeah, we do automation testing. Then you can turn the question around. What types of automation testing do you guys use for your mobile solution, right? And then they might say, oh, we are building an app and we want to uh, drive the uh, app interface with, um, you know, and our developers all write Java. And you might say, oh, cool, okay, well, you know, our, um, based off of what we, we, we have in our past, we have developed, we have testers that, um, that can write, um, that have, you know, experience using Appium testing, uh, have run GUI functional UI testing, and they can automate this in where. So that's exactly up there. Now, we don't own the tools and we don't sell tools, right? Uh, we're tools agnostic, we, but we do work with companies to figure out what tools they need, and we also make recommendations, and we also execute on that. So just as much as you do manual testing, we do do automation testing also. Okay. Thanks, Tom. Okay. Any other questions?
Okay, if I had more time, I would ask you guys, but then I, I wanted to keep it at two minutes over. So thank you guys for attending. I will save this recording and uh, send you guys a copy. That will be on, Thanks, upload on YouTube. Okay, bye, everyone. Bye.